Of all of the subgenres of science fiction, I believe nothing makes the brain pop quite like first contact. In an instant, humanity goes from being totally alone in the universe, possibly the only living thing there ever was and ever will be, to just one of maybe an infinite number of life forms. And that's just day one of first contact. What happens next varies wildly from author to author. Some choose to write about the sense of wonder. This is a discovery to be celebrated, an opportunity to learn and to transcend who we are. Welcome to Earth! And others use it to highlight the flaws in our collective character. We inflict war and flex greed. The hubris and hostile self-interest of humans will be our downfall. Peter Watts goes way beyond the storytelling tropes of meeting aliens for the very first time. The question isn't what would extraterrestrials be like or what is life, but rather what is intelligence? What is consciousness? Not all first contact novels are created equal. Not all first contact novels are blindsight. The book gradually presents a plethora of thought experiments and philosophical questions. As I got deeper into the narrative, I could feel something, something creeping, like a giant wet spider on the back of my neck. But before we get there, Watts gives us his take on first contact. In the year 2082, something a group of objects burn up in Earth's atmosphere in a precise grid formation while simultaneously emitting a burst of energy. We speculate that the planet has been scanned by extraterrestrials. For reasons unknown and with haunting ambiguity, we're not alone in the universe anymore, but we don't know who we share it with. A few years later, we detect a radio signal in the Oort cloud we send some probes, we send a crewed ship, and finally, we discover the alien vessel. First Contact Part 2. And then Blind Sight gets really interesting. It's not that the first act is superfluous or a bait and switch tactic, but once we start to peel back the layers of what makes these aliens tick, I had this revelation that this was the heart of the story. This is what Peter Watts really wanted to talk about. He does give us cool spaceships, artificial intelligence, nine-legged aliens, explosions, robots, and space vampires. More on those in a minute. It's a great plot. There's so much to love about this book, but really it's a conduit to study consciousness and self-awareness. I think we assume that evolution has favoured intelligence. The smarter something is, the higher the chance of survival. We also assume that intelligence and self-awareness are intertwined. Humans are evidently the most intelligent life form on the planet. We are also the most aware of what we are, and we can think and perform on a higher plane than a squirrel, for example. Isn't it therefore logical to suggest that a super intelligent alien, one capable of interstellar travel and taking a photograph of our civilization, would have an approximate experience? These aliens are orders of magnitude smarter than us, but they seem to lack self-awareness. They are the hypothesized philosophical zombie. We often encounter this oblivious, ignorant, or seemingly autonomous entity in science fiction. Robots and probes can of course have a very, very intelligent computer brain, but they tend to have a programmed mission. An artificial intelligence can be way smarter than humans, but at least we have a grip on what it is. It's artificial for a start, and things like viruses or mutated life forms are locked into a heightened instinct for survival, just going through the motions. You can't reason with cancer. It has a limited connection with reality. Blindsight proposes something deeply disturbing. 
that self-awareness is a defect, not a benefit. What if the meaning of life is just none of our goddamn business? It's worth breaking away from my pretentious monologue to say that although Peter Watts is conducting a piece of fiction here, he's also using the book to express something that he considers to be very real, the illusion of consciousness. And that's what elevates Blindsight above the mob of books that talk about meeting funny looking aliens for the first time. It makes me think about the nature of life itself and what it means to exist in the universe, what it means to be alive. And that's something way beyond the plot. I took it a step further and talked to the man himself, Peter Watts. You know, you start with the, you start with the question of what is consciousness good for? And you end up with, with you know, the, the free energy minimization people say, if they're right, our brains are aspiring for non, to non-consciousness. The only reason we're conscious is because we're constantly being surprised by our environment. The smarter we get, the more familiar things become, the less unexpected events happen to us, the less conscious we will become because consciousness is an incredibly energy expensive process. And the only time it manifests is when we have to sort of deal with the unexpected. What's unexpected to something is 10 times as smart as a human being. What's unexpected to something with 15 million times the mass of a human brain. When you get too smart, you stop being conscious entirely. The point is you build an internal model of, of the universe. And as long as the feedback that you're getting from the outside conforms to that model, it's steady as she goes. You don't need to think consciously about it. You're just driving to work. The moment the input coming in from outside varies from that, you suddenly have an error term. And when that error term opens up, that's where consciousness emerges. So the fewer error terms you get, the fewer, the, the smaller the error, the less opportunity and need for consciousness. And that's when it dawned on me. He wasn't just hinting at this big idea about self-awareness all the way through the book. The plot itself and the structure and what Blindsight is, is an analogy for self-awareness. It's all woven in to everything right from the beginning of the book. We encounter the ultimate bifurcation of intelligence and consciousness in the aliens, but the varying degrees of sentience are displayed and experienced through the members of the crew and the ship itself. The narrator of the book has had a medical procedure that detaches the emotional part of his brain, effectively turning him into an empathy barometer. Not necessarily an unreliable narrator, maybe too reliable. The linguist is a woman who has the personalities of four separate entities in her mind, each with their own relationships with other members of the crew. And the ship's doctor is in love with one of them. Yeah, it's, it's weird. The combat specialist controls a group of drone proxy robot things. And that's yet another example of that filter between brain and action. There are backup crew members ready to thaw out if anyone gets killed. You just transfer a few memories to get them up to speed, which begs the question, what is consciousness to an uploaded memory? And the captain of the ship is an artificial intelligence which only exclusively communicates with the de facto organic leader of the mission, a fella called Sarasti, who's a vampire. So with the crew, the ship and the aliens, Watts is illustrating the sliding scale of the subjective interface with reality. Varying degrees of transhumans communicating with projections or clones of artificial entities, memories of clones, cloned memories in different artificial entities, different transhuman stages communicating and overlapping with each other, not necessarily on the same time frame or level of experience in what they're trying to communicate. It's a multi-layered Chinese room within the plot. 
and I found it absolutely terrifying. Th there's that wet spider again. The entire book has an uneasy feeling to it. From the grand scale of the solar system and beyond, to the depths of the ripples of the mind. The Earth is visited by aliens. We get that moment, but it's shrouded in mystery. We don't have anybody to talk to, and it's uncomfortable knowing that something is out there. Then we encounter them, and they are a blunt but calculating, dead-eyed life form. What do they want? They don't even understand the concept of communication. They don't understand the concept of a concept. And then there's the physical location, perched at the edge of the solar system in a sea of inky black space. Light speed effectively making any rescue redundant, all alone. Even your crewmates are islands of their own thoughts. And of course, the vampire. Why would Watts include something so potentially comical, camp, silly as a vampire? There must be countless ways to introduce another layer of horror if that's what he was going for. I think he absolutely nailed it. The idea of the vampire being the opposite of the abstract fear of the unknown, which is where most of the creepiness comes from blindsight. Vampires are folklore made real. In the universe of blindsight, vampires are a real thing. They are a genetic side branch. They are part of our blood and that's a completely different sort of fear. Tamed and controlled for now, but forever something that strikes an inherent fear. A fear that cannot be escaped in the depths of space. But that true horror, that giant wet spider on the back of my neck, is the blind sight itself. That liminal space of self-awareness, intelligence creeping like a virus. A disease that survives without empathy, without reason, without even thought. The dark side of consciousness.